Pace at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. When stress rises, so does family violence. Over the last couple of weeks, you've seen us report on a lot of shootings, some of them related to domestic abuse. A survivor and an advocate told me today, sadly, they're not surprised considering the economic struggle families are experiencing right now. It's part of my series confronting domestic violence, loving and fear. It took me like uh, maybe 20 calls, you know, before I actually said, hey, I really just need to go in and um, be at a shelter. This abuse survivor staying at the battered women and children's shelter is concealing her identity for her and her daughter's safety. It's not just physical abuse, you know, it's it's financial abuse and it's emotional abuse. I started getting physical. Um, that's when I started to seek help. She says it got worse during the pandemic, which puts severe stress on them financially. Me having a degree and not working um, really played a toll in the blame, the blame game of, you know, it's your fault that, you know, we don't have money, but I was willing to work um, anywhere. But he wouldn't let her. She wasn't even allowed to use a computer or a cell phone, leaving her fully dependent on him. Recently, things grew more dire. Definitely the rise in all the prices of gas and food, you know, with still not having any uh, food stamp assistance or um, you know, a good paying job. She's one of many who have had to escape recent stress induced violence. Those numbers have been increasing lately in the last weeks have been increasing. Family Violence Prevention Services CEO Marta Belaya says her staff at the shelter is inundated with calls from victims. And they will mention, well, yes, you know, food is beginning to be an issue with us. She wants people to know her office provides much more than shelter, food, medical help, counseling, legal help. They do have a hotline that, you know, they can help you. You and and when you're ready, they don't they don't rush you. She and Palaya is sending the same message. Stress of any kind is never an excuse for violence. If you or someone you know is struggling with abuse, we have a long list of resources on our website, ksat.com slash domestic violence. You can also always call the hotline 800 799 7233. Help is out there. Well, also at six, a vigil getting underway right now for Kevin Johnson. He was shot and killed by three San Antonio police officers yesterday. According to police, Johnson was wanted on a felony warrant, pulled a gun on officers who were trying to arrest him. That shooting just blocks away from Woodlawn Lake created a lot of tension between police and people in the area, some of them family members. Lee Waldman joins us live from the vigil. Lee, a tense situation yesterday you were right in the middle of. Has that anger turned to anguish today? It has, and a lot of the family is still on their way over to this vigil right now. We did just speak with some of Kevin Johnson's cousins, and they say, yeah, obviously they're heartbroken. They're wearing shirts with his face on it, saying in loving memory of Kevin Johnson. You see some of them standing behind me here with red balloons. I actually want to direct you over this way. We are just yards away from where Kevin Johnson was killed. He was killed down in that embankment. You can see two of his cousins walking there, looking at the area where their cousin took his last breath. Um, there's even still some police tape from yesterday's situation waiting out there. We know that his sister Jasmine and his other sisters are on their way here right now. We spoke with them just a few hours ago, around 3 o'clock, and they tell me that they were meeting with their city councilman, District 1 City Councilman Mario Bravo, talking about their concerns about what happened yesterday. They're demanding answers. We also got a, a notice from Act 4 SA. They're a watchdog organization. They're also demanding answers, asking for accountability, asking for that body camera video to be released within 72 hours. Tonight, we do know that San Antonio Police Department's policy is to release audio and video after a critical incident within 60 days. So we're still waiting on more information on that from San Antonio police officers. But this vigil should be getting underway any moment now as more family makes their way over to this bridge in this area again just yards away from where Kevin Johnson was killed yesterday. Thank you. That's our Lee Waldman reporting along with Johnson's family and San Antonio police. City Hall also wants to know more about what led up to this fatal shooting and the tense confrontation with police that followed. However, until the body camera footage is released in 60 days and more details are confirmed, Mayor Ron Nuremberg and several city council members are withholding comment. They offered their condolences to Johnson's family, but say they also need to know more about the circumstances. I'm going to stay on top of the situation, stay informed, make sure that the community gets all the information that they need.
Bravo said the West Side incident occurred near the border between districts one and five. Since it's still a very active case, SAPD has said it will not have an update until its investigation is complete. The Bear County Medical Examiner identifying a man killed in a suspected drunk driving crash over the weekend. 27 year old Robert Anthony Gutierrez killed in the collision at Highway 151 in Petranco a little before two Sunday morning. Police say Gutierrez was a passenger in one of the vehicles involved in the crash. Now, according to officers, the driver of the other car driving drunk when he caused that crash, he was arrested and booked for intoxication manslaughter. Transgender rights in the headlines recently with several laws targeting transgender people, transgender kids and their parents. Popular San Antonio radio host Mike Taylor has become a well known advocate for transgender families. He's in one. He tells our RJ Marquez why he will continue to fight for the rights of transgender children in Texas and why he says he's doing it from thousands of miles away. It is the four o'clock hour. It's a familiar voice heard every day across San Antonio and South Texas. My name is Mike Taylor, radio mercenary. Mike Taylor has been a local radio staple for more than a decade, but about two years ago, his family moved more than 3,000 miles away to live in Hawaii, in part to protect his transgender son, MJ. Texas didn't have any laws on the books that would protect us from said future discrimination. Now. Now they're trying to pass laws that would absolutely just totally discriminate against us. The latest directive from Governor Greg Abbott called for abuse investigations into the use of gender affirming care for transgender children. Last week, a Texas judge issued a statewide halt to those investigations, but Taylor says it's difficult to see his son and the trans community be attacked. We have leaders in Austin that are trying to pass discriminatory laws. That's what they are, discriminatory laws against my son and maybe even me. Uh, is so disheartening and devastating. And Mike continues to use his platform to speak out for families of trans children, and he also wants to clear up some misconceptions about the community. It's not a mental disorder. We're just normal people. That's the message that I want out there. There are people in the state that think that we're all having underground, illegal, unethical surgeries. No one is. We're normal people. And that's all Taylor wants for his son, to grow up being a normal kid. He'll keep doing his San Antonio show from Hawaii until MJ can have a normal life in the state he used to call home. Everyone that knows him still loves him. He's beloved here by the people that matter. There's just a few people that don't understand us. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. On Friday, by the way, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton posted on Twitter that his office appealed that judge's ruling, saying he will win this fight to, in his words, protect Texas children. Arson investigators trying to determine what started a fire that destroyed a building under construction. Firefighters found flames and smoke coming from the wood frame structure early this morning. It was at the corner of Center and North Swiss Streets that's east of downtown. As Katrina Weber reports, people in another building were forced to leave their homes. San Antonio firefighters approaching this fire around three this morning found it had a heated head start. All they could do was work it from the outside. As parts of what had been a building under construction at Center and North Swiss Streets began collapsing. We had just come from another structure fire four or five blocks away, and on our arrival, it was already fully involved. Firefighters say it didn't take long for the fire to move throughout what was largely a wooden frame. They were concerned about what else it might do. Our main focus was, was making sure that that other building didn't catch fire and also evacuating the tenants uh, that were still inside. My husband woke me up and um, everything was just orange. We don't have blinds in our home, so everything just looked orange. It was hot inside. Arlene Nichols was one of about 20 neighbors ushered out of their homes next door. Firefighters had a legitimate fear about the fire spreading. Look what the heat did to this car and check out how it melted those garbage cans. As it turned out, that car belonged to Nichols and the unpleasant side effects for her kept on coming. All our windows are broken. <laughs> Just the heat, yeah, it, made, it did a lot of damage. The fire also knocked down power lines, but no people were hurt. What had been a plan for new homes, though, is now up in smoke and burned to the ground. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic right now on this Tuesday. We're going to go to 281 in Hildebrand, and you can see uh, some sort of accident, maybe a fender bender underneath uh, the overpass at Hildebrand. But again, traffic moving in both directions. Very heavy, though, 
as it heads towards downtown. A lot of activities taking place downtown because of spring break. I saw the zoo was busy, the Pearl area busy, the Riverwalk busy. Good to see business coming back to San Antonio, the tourism business. Yeah, absolutely. And they have beautiful weather this week. I know we've been saying if you had spring break last week, <laughs> you were wishing it was this week, but it is nice outside. It is a beautiful day again today, and we're enjoying this while we can because we know the humidity and the heat is just around the corner. But remember, it takes that humidity to make some much needed rain. There is that potential in the extended forecast. We're going to get into that in a bit. First of all, what really stands out to me today with our almanac, maximum wind gust 39 miles per hour measured at the airport. But you look at the most recent gusts and they're closer to 20 miles per hour. The wind will continue to subside over the next couple of hours and you're really not going to notice it probably by eight, nine o'clock. I mean, through six, seven o'clock wind gusts, 18 to 20 miles per hour. But by 10 o'clock, we're looking at five miles per hour, pretty much calm later on this evening and temperatures falling off pretty quickly as well. Clear skies, calm wind developing and dry air 78 now but 58 by 11 p.m. We're going to talk more about our temperature trend, a weak cold front that's headed our way, and, he, and some increasing rainfall potential in the extended forecast in just a bit. I'm Dylan Collier on the night beat. A local couple says their plate of nachos had an extra ingredient, the powerful painkiller hydrocodone. Come with us as we go behind the kitchen door. That's a 10 plus is a question a lot of people dread on a job application. How much did you make at your last job? The Biden administration wants to ban federal agencies from asking that question. How that affects job seekers tonight on the night beat at 10. New at six, a lot of things can cause dry eyes from disease to too much screen time, but fixing it is tough and eye drops don't always do the trick. Ursula Perry shows us how the condition where your body doesn't produce enough tears might improve with the right diet. If your eyes are constantly irritated, itchy, painful or red, you might have dry eye syndrome. Eye drops are one treatment option, but what you eat could also help or hurt your eyes. But there is definitely a correlation between a bad inflammatory diet and worsening of the dry eye. So things that are inflammatory, so dairy is inflammatory, meats are inflammatory, eggs are inflammatory. Dr. Toyo says avoid processed foods whenever possible. So what should you eat? Omega-3 fatty acids reduce inflammation and dry eye symptoms. They're found in fish like trout, salmon, sardines, and mackerel. If they aren't a fish eater, we'll have them start an omega-3 uh, supplement. Vitamin C has also been shown to protect the eyes from pollution and improve tear production. It's abundant in broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and citrus fruits. Vitamin E is found in sunflower oil, almonds, pumpkin, and spinach. That helps to protect the retina from injury and supports the maintenance of the tear film layer in the eye. Vitamin A, which is found in carrots, squash, and tuna, may also reduce your dry eye symptoms and improve tear quality. And recent studies now show that caffeine in drinks like coffee, black tea, and green tea may stimulate tear production, too. Studies have shown that the worst dry eye symptoms sometimes can be linked to a vitamin D deficiency. The cure for that? Come out into the sunshine for 10 to 15 minutes a day. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Got some breaking news I want to take you to is Sky 12 right now. This is a massive grass fire just 12 miles south of Jordanton. This is along FM 3387 and Highway 16. And when I say massive, we're talking about more than 1,000 acres that have been burned so far and only 50% contained. Yeah, this has been going on since 1230 with these winds we've been talking about not helping at all. 10 fire departments, 30 trucks, the Texas Forest Service all on the scene right now. We do know one firefighter had a medical episode and is being treated. <laughs> This is just a huge fire, 50% contained. Yeah, and it's being fought from on the ground, also uh, from the air. So we're going to continue to monitor this again. It's been going on for almost six hours now. It is 50% contained, but again, more than 1,000 acres burned so far. And I think if you look down in the smoke there, you can see one of those helicopters uh, that's actually flying down there and trying to uh, put some of this fire out. But 
just an indication of how dry it is. Yeah. It, yes, and th not just the ground right now, but also the air, and that's one thing that fuels these fires. You know, the weather doesn't cause these fires, but if something sparks, the conditions that we have right now, take a look at our dry air, the conditions are favorable to spread those fires. So one thing is the very dry air, the relative humidity, how much moisture is in the air relative to how much the air can hold at our current temperature. So we're only holding about 14% of the amount of moisture the air could hold at our given temperature right now. So very dry air in place and of course the gusty winds. Luckily the winds are really going to be hitting the brakes soon. Within a couple of hours you're not even going to notice the wind. The wind really helps to spread those fires in these dry conditions. And of course we could use some rain. We had a few showers east of town last night. Now that system is far out of here. We're talking moving over Louisiana, Arkansas, and the southeastern US. So that rain making system moving even farther away from us and most of the rain with it was in East Texas last night. We're still on the search for some good soaking rain and a shift in our weather pattern is starting to look a little more promising for what could be some beneficial rain. Let's talk about it. First of all, Moving on to the West Coast, you see some moisture moving on shore into the Inner Mountain West. That's part of a system that's going to be dropping into Texas on Thursday into Friday. Problem for us, too far north. The energy with it is going to miss us. Most of the moisture is going to miss us. Another sunny day. But we fast forward on into Monday, and I know that's still pretty far away, especially meteorologically speaking, it's pretty far away. But the trends have been that this big disturbance and this big dip in the upper level flow is starting to move toward a more favorable position to give us some better rain chances. So the positioning of it, at least the trends that we're seeing, are looking more promising and that would be for next Monday. So on Monday right now we give it a 40% chance, but you definitely want to check back in as we follow the trends because this could very well rise even higher than that. But here's the caveat. Should we see something develop on Monday? It could become a strong to severe thunderstorm. So it could come at a little bit of a cost uh, for f some communities, but we need the moisture and this time of year, sometimes that moisture comes at the cost of some severe weather. So something to monitor and definitely check back in in the days ahead. Let's talk temperatures. 78 degrees right now, dew point 29. There's that dry air. The dew point's the true measure of the moisture in the air and then you can calculate the relative humidity. It all boils down to that dry air we talked about. And some temperatures are actually into the 80s, the typically warmer spots, south of Highway 90, closer to the Rio Grande, Eagle Pass 82, Catula 86 degrees. You get to Bernie 73, Bandera 76, but Stinson's still at 83 degrees. By tomorrow morning, we anticipate temperatures down in the 40s. So from near 80 now, down into the low to mid 40s to start the day tomorrow, about 41 Bernie. Converse area about 46 degrees, Nixon 43, but then by the afternoon, shorts and short sleeves. So yeah, maybe a light jacket early at the bus stop, but later in the day, just like today, around 80 and even getting into the 80s for a good portion of our area. I mean, Hondo 85 tomorrow, Converse 82, Bulverde 80 degrees. So we'll be feeling the warmth tomorrow with wall to wall sunshine, a little below average in the morning, above average in the afternoon. That's our temperature trend. Big temperature swing from sunrise to sunset and just a south wind at 5 to 15. So you're not going to be noticing the wind much tomorrow. Wall to wall sunshine, as we talked about, that's all we're going to have. And then looking ahead, the wind's going to pick up again on Friday. A gusty day again on Friday with some dry air in place, and that's behind a weak cold front that hits Thursday night. And that's going to reset our temperatures from the low to mid 80s Wednesday and Thursday back down into the mid 70s on Friday. And by the way, I do want to point out Thursday morning travel, a little bit of fog there, but jumping ahead to next Monday again, we have it at that 40% chance with the possibility of increasing that something we're really focusing on, keeping an eye on, and you need to check back in in the coming days. A good week to have your case at weather app handy. There you go. Yeah. Always a good week yeah. to have that handy. All right. The Texans playing a weird game of let's make a deal right now. Well, they won a lot of draft picks for Deshaun Watson has been cleared of criminal charges. We knew of four teams who were very interested. Now you can add a fifth team. When we come back, more about Deshaun's new suit tour and super seniors at UTSA giving their college careers one more year. Coming up. football coverage.
Powered by Davis Law Firm. The league season of the NFL kicks off tomorrow, and already we have some shockers as Deshaun Watson shots for a new team. A new option has emerged. Watson, who was cleared of any criminal charges last Friday by a Houston grand jury, was scheduled or has already met with the Carolina Panthers and the New Orleans Saints, who have already made offers to the Texans and the Cleveland Browns. But now the Atlanta Falcons have emerged as a sleeper team to compete for Watson's talents, according to ESPN. Scheduled to meet with Deshaun tomorrow. Watson still is facing 22 civil lawsuits from women who claim he sexually assaulted of them during massages, but with the criminal charges off the table, teams are lining up for his talents, even though the NFL has not revealed what their investigation will result in. Stunner in Dallas after reviving his NFL career, Randy Gregory is turning his back on the Cowboys and instead will sign with the Denver Broncos for the exact same deal. That's after reports indicate owner Jerry Jones had a salary forfeiture clause added, which is standard for Cowboys after there were multiple reports that the edge rusher was locked in on a five-year $70 million deal with $28 million of that guarantee just hours ago, but instead he's taking the exact same deal with Denver that does not include that clause. Gregory is coming out the best season of his career, starting 11 of 12 games he played in with six sacks, three forced fumbles, and even one interception. While hearing more about the contract that Aaron Rodgers signed with the Green Bay Packers, Rodgers will make $150 million in the first three years of his deal, starting with almost $42 million to be paid to him this season, with $41 million of that going as a signing bonus. He does have two voidable years, 2025 and 2026, but he would have already made millions of dollars by then. Since making Greg Popovich the all-time winningest coach with 1,336 victories, the Spurs have been unable to win since. They have now lost two in a row, seven out of their last ten games, but still sit in the 12th playoff position now. She's a 12th position, getting ready for the playoffs, two games behind the New Orleans Pelicans, who hold the 10th and final play-in position in the Western Conference. And with just 13 games left in the regular season, the Spurs are facing must-wins to close out their seven-game homestand against the Oklahoma City Thunder tomorrow and the New Orleans Pelicans on Friday. It's after they were mauled by Minnesota last night, 149-139. A game that saw Keldon Johnson set a new career high with 34 points, only to be outperformed by seven-foot all-star Carl Anthony Towns, who scored an NBA season high, career and franchise high, 60 points, 56 of those coming in the first three quarters of the game. A lot of people forget it's our first year uh, being the young group going to play. You look at Memphis, this is their, what, third, fourth year together. It's the reason why they're at where they're at, you know. So chemistry and, and being familiar with who you're playing with and who's your teammates is important in this league, you know, whether you're a young team or a veteran team. All right, next up will be Oklahoma City tomorrow night at the AT&T Center. While the UTSA Roadrunners enjoy a spring break, they managed to get in four days of hard work and spring workouts before a few days off. Now that the Roadrunners have enjoyed success in the second year under Jeff Trailer as head coach, they now know they face a much tougher road ahead after their 12-win season in Conference USA title. And that means relying on super seniors again, like outside linebacker Dadrian Taylor, to carry their success forward. So why come back for one more year? Why not? I mean, I was here in 2017 when we were in the basement, you know what I'm saying? So, like, to see all of this, you know what I'm saying, come to life and not want to be a part of it one more time, you know what I'm saying? Now, you can imagine how much progress they have made in just two years under trailer and the sky's the limit. But so remember, much tougher opponents this year. His answer would have been my answer, too. There you go. Why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah, why not come back? Thank you, Greg. You got it. We're going to talk Texas oil and gas production when we come back. Gas prices, something we have all noticed, the pain at the pump. So what's happening in Texas? Are we seeing more production and will the Eagle Ford shale come back alive? Todd Staples is the president of the Texas Oil and Gas Association. He's also the former agriculture commissioner for the state of Texas. But we're going to talk oil with him right now. And so, Todd, I appreciate your time. Do you see Texas playing a role in making up what we're losing because of what's happening in Ukraine? Texas really is the energy capital of the world, Steve, and we have the ability, we have the resources, we have the population, and we have the right policies in Texas to continue to move forward. The Eagle Ford Shell is a dynamic oil play uh, for our nation and the world. Uh, right now, they're producing about 1.1 million barrels a day. Forecasts indicate that the Eagle Ford will pick up speed in April and increase that to uh, by about 23,000 barrels a day, which is meaningful. 
And so how do, does the U.S. go about making itself energy self-sufficient if, if that in fact is what we're going to aim for? We, we've heard a lot about that energy self-sufficient term. Energy self-sufficiency, energy security, these are all terms that are really are achievable for the United States. Pre-COVID, we were producing about 13 million barrels a day just in the United States. That dropped off to about 11 million at its low. We're back up to about 11.6. The president signaled uh, something very strong the other day when he said that we're not going to import any more Russian oil products. That was a very strong and loud signal, but we need a, two signals to be heard. The second signal is we want to reset American energy policy. We want to grow our production here at home because for the last couple of years, we've heard that they, they want to stop drilling. We have seen the Keystone Pipeline canceled. We have seen uh, permit processes delayed, and we have seen leases being halted. These all send a very chilling effect to the industry when you think about growth because we need to have that long-term growth. I think it's important for our consumers who are feeling the pain at the pump, and it's very important to our partners, countries around the globe that want to escape from being in the clutches of these countries that are doing them harm, and we need to step up. And I think that we can, but we need that signal that we're serious about an, an, an energy plan for America and to really unleash American energy leadership. And you think that needs to come from the White House is kind of what you think some of your associations waiting for right now? We really do. It was it was encouraging, Steve, uh, to hear U.S. Secretary of Energy at the Sarah Week in Houston last week say that we do need more domestic production. But after two or three years of hearing uh, the efforts and seeing uh, things like FERC, our Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to, to have longer processes to approve LNG plants and to approve pipelines, it does have a chilling effect when we have this divestment uh, mantra that we've been heard. So I think the president really needs to send this strong signal. It's time to reset. It's time to collaborate. And we need, we can do things in America if we'll work together, but we need that partnership from Washington. When you talk about the Keystone Pipeline and things like that, I mean, like you said, that's a long-term solution. Are there things short-term that can be done? I mean, I, I know that there are leases out there that are not being pumped right now. I mean, are, are we seeing some of those things become more active? And is this going to have an effect on the Texas economy overall? It will certainly have a huge impact on the Texas economy. I mean, the fact that we're seeing these elevated prices, every taxpayer in Texas, every school child in Texas, everyone that drives a car is going to benefit because that money that the state of Texas will receive is going to go to fund our rules, roads, fund our schools, and fund our universities. And so Texans will all be uh, beneficiaries of this. But our industry would like to see stability. We do not want to see harm to anyone, and we really need that stability. You bring up leases that are not being drilled. That's so such a diversion when I heard the, the administration talk about that because there are about 9,000 leases out of 36,000 leases that are actually being worked and are being you know explored. So you have a small subset of that that's not of those there still needs to be 4,600 permits approved. And then we have environmental groups that are actually uh, attacking the, these leases. And the irony here is that in America, we produce the most environmentally friendly oil anywhere in the world. Uh, our companies have made significant commitments to achieve the climate goals that society is talking about today. And American can, can lead the way. Our carbon dioxide emissions have actually decreased substantially over a 10 year period, while both China and Russia has increased over 20%. So the United States can lead and we can lead in an environmentally friendly way and we can meet our climate goals all while achieving the, the energy that really fuels modern life. Can things be done short term, though, Todd, to, to bring down the gas prices? It, it's going to be difficult on a short term basis. Uh, we, we, we are excited that in Texas, our rig count has increased from 312 to 320 rigs right here in the Lone Star State alone. And so our companies are really everyone that is producing oil today is looking for new and better ways to do that um, in order to bring it down. We have seen a big drop. You know, Steve, over the last uh, three or four days from 130 Brent to now back into the 90s, uh, some of that is due to the, the new outbreak of COVID in China. Uh, some of that is due to some hopeful peace talks 
And some of that is due to, I believe, an increase uh, announced in the interest rate. And so we know that things can happen to settle that pricing again. But the biggest thing the market needs to see in order to give this immediate relief that every driver is looking for is certainty that we in America will utilize the resources that we have and that we truly unleash American energy leadership. That's what we need for the short term and the long term. And you said we need to step up if that in fact happens. Do you see prices getting worse or before they get better? Or you said you're seeing a downturn right now. Yeah, we've seen a downturn now, Courtney, but we're, the volatility it, it, that is created in this marketplace just brings about so many uh, uncertainties and uncertainty is the enemy of growth. And so while the, the, the situation is so unstable in the Ukraine, we've seen some positive signs the last few days for the, for the relief at the prices. But um, the reality is until we get a clear vision and outcome from this war, that it, that's that we need that to occur. And, and really, this war is really just exacerbated and really highlighted the poor policy decisions that has led us into uh, not being the, the producer that we need to be today for our own domestic use and around the globe as well. Todd Staples, appreciate your time. President of the Texas Oil and Gas Association. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. All right. we'll, we'll be right back. An early spring storm season in North Texas kicking off early last night and with gusto. This damage left behind in Rockwall, which is northeast of Dallas. The region had the most intense storm action. Yeah, hail, funnel clouds, possible tornado reported. Most of the area east of Dallas under a severe storm warning yesterday into the evening. But the northeast was definitely where Mother Nature flexed her muscle, that part of the state. The rest of the area just saw a little storm activity and brief downpours. We want to take you back to some of that breaking news that we told you earlier about that 1,000 acre plus fire that is happening 12 miles south of Jordanton. This is FM 3387 and Highway 16. This has been going on since 1230 today, so a massive response. 10 fire departments, 30 trucks, the Texas Forest Service all on the ground there. And you can tell with this video that we're showing you right now, they are making progress. At last report, it was about 50% contained. It's been burning since 1230 this afternoon, but you can see more than a thousand acres burned. Still some hot spots as you can see with the smoke off in the distance, but certainly even a lot better than what we saw, you know, just a few minutes right, ago. Right. We do know one firefighter had a medical episode, um, but he's being treated and this is going to continue into the night. All right, let's take a live cam right now as we uh, look out onto the beautiful city. And I've been talking about all week about how great it is to see so many visitors and locals downtown, the Pearl, I'm guessing some of the amusement parks probably doing a really good business. And something else of note tonight, if you're outdoors, we have a space station flyover that will be visible. This is at 8.50 p.m., so 8.50, 8.50 p.m. It's gonna last five minutes, maximum height, 86 degrees, so nearly directly above you just a few minutes after 8.50. It's going to appear out of the southwest and disappear to the northeast. If you haven't seen it before, looks like a really bright light, just quickly but steadily moving across the sky. Again, 8.50 p.m. is when we have that space station flyover. We need some rain, and it, there is a glimmer of hope with some potential rain chances in the forecast, even promising rain chances. We'll get to it in just a bit. Well, the sun finally came out. I mean, if you compare today to last time this week, last week, it's just, I mean, total difference. Yeah. I, I was on spring break with the family. So you wouldn't know. We were skiing <laughs> in 11 inches of fresh snow. All right, great. so not that cold. <laughs> so you weren't here. Is it, I mean, it, no, you I, know, yeah. I, I did look at the uh, at what happened, though, last week. And yeah, this is a big difference. And um, it, we're noticing the warmer weather that's, moving into town and enjoying at least the lack of humidity and mugginess with the warmer temperatures. But it was very gusty today. The wind is calming down. It's really slamming the brakes here over the next couple of hours, and it's going to be calm overnight tonight. It's not going to be an issue again until we get into Friday. That's going to be another gusty day, maybe even gustier than what we had today. And then 
We're promising rain chances by Monday, so let's talk about all of this, starting with the wind, then we'll jump into those rain chances. You take a look at the most recent wind gusts, and they're roughly between 15 and 20 miles per hour. Definitely less than what we had earlier today, and we're going to continue to see that downward trend here just over the next couple of hours for those wind gusts. Take a look at our forecast. You know, 6 o'clock this hour, we're seeing those gusts to 18 miles per hour. Yes, by 8 o'clock, 10 miles per hour, and by 10 o'clock, only about 5 miles per hour. So a big drop off in those winds pretty quickly, just in the matter of hours. 78 degrees right now. We briefly hit 80 earlier today and our most recent gust at the airport 21 miles per hour. That's going to really be cut down very soon. Look at the bigger picture of temperatures and in the typically warmer spots. We're well into the 80s. That includes Catula 86. Del Rio 82 degrees along with Hondo and into the hill country. We've got temperatures in the 70s. So Canyon Lake, Bulverde 74. Meanwhile, Stinson 83 and Divine at 80 degrees. Temperatures cooling quickly this evening. I mean, we're going to be in the upper 50s by 11 p.m. and then eventually settling in the low to mid 40s by tomorrow morning. That's 41 in Bernie, 43 in Floresville, Converse 46 degrees. So a bit of a chill in the air tomorrow morning, but very briefly. I mean, have the long sleeves at the bus stop, the light jacket briefly because we warm up pretty quickly and by the afternoon tomorrow, you can be shorts and short sleeves. No problem. Hello to about 80. Poteet 84 and Pleasanton 85 for the high and we're thinking in and around San Antonio about 82 to 83 degrees Thursday, even a few degrees warmer well into the 80s. Then a week cold front hits temperatures fall off a little bit. I mean, we're not talking a huge drop here just from the mid 80s on Thursday down into the mid 70s by Friday and that's average for this time of year. All right, let's get to the rain and some more promising rain chances in the extended forecast. This big swirl here, Arkansas, Louisiana, that's a system that just clipped us yesterday with a few showers east of town. Dynamic system, a lot of moisture with it. It triggered some severe weather in East Texas yesterday. That's all moving out of here, moving away from us. And there is going to be another disturbance, upper level system that drops into Texas on Thursday. Uh, the key is North Texas here, a little too far away from us to give us the much needed energy and rain making energy for Thursday. But by Monday of next week, we're seeing a trend here in the computer guidance that is pushing this disturbance a little farther south in a more favorable position to increase our rain chances. Again, this isn't until Monday. A lot of time between then and now, so you definitely want to check back in and we'll give you the updates and keep you updated on our thoughts. But right now with the trends that we're seeing, we're actually increasing those rain chances a bit. So big old goose egg, 0% tomorrow through Sunday. Yeah, we can expect that with nothing but sunshine. But by Monday, right now we've bumped it up to 40% with the potential of going higher. Uh, and of course, we hope it goes higher, but one caveat here is that it could come at a bit of a cost with some severe weather. So if we do see storms on Monday, there's a chance they could be strong to severe. Again, that's far away. We want to check back in for the latest in the days ahead. Check, the, check this out. 10 o'clock, 60 degrees, midnight, mid 50s, and we talked about the 40s tomorrow morning. And then that little temperature drop on Friday back down into the mid 70s. And we're going to mostly be in the 70s Friday through the weekend. Monday, humid. That 40% chance, that's what we're focusing on and watching because this forecast will change in the days ahead. All right, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning, rise and shine. It is Tuesday, the 15th. Inside a building that they say was still under construction, this is on Center Street, not far from East Houston and Cherry Streets. They could only attack the fire from the outside because part of the structure uh, were starting, parts of the structure were starting to collapse. There was a concern that the flames might spread to an occupied building across the street. So firefighters woke up the people in that building and got them out. About 20 people in all evacuated. No, no, two people are waiting to see when they can go back after a fire on the north side. Crews could see smoke coming from the attic. Firefighters first helped two people who were inside that house get out safely. Then they put out the flames, which caused about $20,000 worth of damage. It's not clear why the fire started or when the residents will be able to return to their home. No secret, prices have been going up. And last month, a key inflation gauge hit double digits. 
It's the U.S. Producer Price Index. It tracks what America's producers get paid for their goods and services on average over time. Well, the U.S. government says it rose 10 percent for the 12-month period that ended in February. Now to the latest on the initiative to address public health in Bear County. The county and University Health System partnering up to create a new public health division. The idea came about after the city, county and university health system worked together during the pandemic to provide care to all of Bear County. Bear County's investment is about no longer allowing a person's zip code to determine his or her health outcomes. Nothing but sunshine tomorrow. We're going to be well into the 80s again, even pushing 90 degrees closer to the Rio Grande, but around Holotus, 80 degrees, Converse 82 and Elmendorf 83. So you get the idea. 80s next couple of days. By Friday, we're back down into the mid 70s, so a little reset in our temperatures and gusty again on Friday. We could have some gusts up to 40 miles per hour. Quiet through the weekend, then on Monday, that's our next potential for some rainfall. And we're watching the upper level pattern and what the guidance is giving us. And we will be fine tuning those rain chances in the days ahead, right now at 40%, but we'll keep you updated. Thanks so much for watching. See you at 10 on the night beat.